I think I wrote in my business plan, journalism budgets are shrinking and I am the substitute teacher. I will come in with no drama, handle something for you for two weeks, and then I will leave. Um, Like, I think I literally wrote that down. Um, Ah, yes. The almighty riff leads us into another CNF Friday, or whenever the hell you listen to this. I'm Brendan O'Mara, and this is the Creative Nonfiction Podcast, the show where I speak to badass people about the art and craft of telling true stories. This week I welcome Jenny Gritters to the show, True Grit. (laughs) How many times in college was she called that? I'm sorry I'm like that. She's 50% of the duo behind the Writers Co-op podcast. The other 50% is Wu Dan Yan, freelancer to the stars. She, uh, of several episodes ago, go check that out or link up in the show notes. You'll see it. I guarantee it. That's a guarantee. Jenny is one of those six-figure freelancers that makes you say, shut the fuck up, really? I mean... I mean that in the most flattering way imaginable. You got to believe me when I say that. So in this episode, we get tactical about how she went about building her freelance writing business. And there's no reason why you can't as well, man. And we talk about her freelance business plan, not waiting for the perfect time and uh, shit sandwiches. Yeah, that, that comes up. She's the mom to a toddler and the wife to a traveling nurse. They recently relocated from Seattle to Central Oregon, so she's like wicked close to me, bro. Uh, This episode's brought to you by Casualty of Words, a writing podcast for people in a hurry. That's you. Episodes are me on mic, just like this, for less than three minutes usually. And it's a little shot in the arm. Someone once called it a gummy vitamin of goodness. And someone else was like, I can listen to this while I'm brushing my teeth. That's right. Casualty of Words. Writing podcast for people in a hurry. All right. Before we get to Jenny, let me give a shout out. Let me out some shouts to a few new Patreon members. Kelly Allen is a tier one CNFer now for the audio mag only tier. That's a new tier. Cheryl Keffer. Hey, Cheryl. She comes to some of the CNF and happy hours. Is uh, getting the audio mag and transcripts. Jasmine is getting the mag and transcript, as are Dale Ingram and George Parker. Annie Tan as well. Those are the newbies. Thank you, and welcome behind the velvet rope. It's totally cool to put your feet up on the coffee table. There's cold beverages in the refrigerator, uh, non-alcoholic and alcoholic. It's your choice. Help yourself if you want to listen to the hottest literary magazine of 2021, You'll need to be a CNF and member, so head over to patreon.com slash cnfpod and shop around. Some nice goodies there. I was out for the for a walk the other day, and I was thinking that I want to be a magazine, an online audio magazine that pays writers the most. Maybe not the most, but I want to start to be known as like, oh, that's a place where you can actually make a happy buck. I'm hoping to pay writers I select for this issue uh, $50 for their pieces. That's the that's the hope. The more patrons I get and members I get, the more I can pay writers. And the more I can pay writers, the more submissions I'll get because people are going to be like, B.O. isn't fucking around. And why would I see an Evers? Yeah, sure, I need to pay for the production because it, uh, it is a heavy lift. Um, and it's uh, it's not cheap. But I also want to funnel a lot of those funds into the pockets of people with the courage to submit their work. So speaking of that, deadline for issue two on the summer-themed issue is the 21st of this month. It is 16 days away as of this recording or the publishable day because it is publishing on March 5th. I want more, baby. I'm getting a few, but I, you know, I want a nice little pile. I want some competition. There is competition, but I, I I want this to be like March Madness, man. And why shouldn't it? It is March. Whoa. <laughs> so uh, if you don't make the cut, don't worry. Because you're not going to get a form rejection from me. You'll get some words. Some words, a little critique. Nothing, nothing too much, but something that'll say, hey, this is X, Y, and Z. 
So guidelines are at the top of the homepage of brendanomero.com. Hey, hey. In any case, I don't want to keep you much longer. I have a pretty long outro uh, that you can stick around for if you want. It's going to be there waiting for you. Otherwise, you can you can skip it. I, I feel the skips when uh, in my chest. That's I, It's a weird cosmic connection to the podcast. I, I feel the skips. I, the, yeah, see right there. I, I felt one. Uh, yeah, because you know, because uh, about 10 seconds from now. Ah, who would I be if I didn't introduce the pair of you, you and Jenny Gritters? Let's hit it. Ooh. Yeah, so I was born in Boston. Um, my dad was in residency there, so my family knew not a soul. And um, we lived there for two years and then moved to the West Coast, which is where I spent most of my childhood. So I spent most of my time growing up in Seattle, uh, which would explain why I'm very outdoorsy. I love hiking. Um, I spent a lot of my time outdoors as a kid. I actually, my parents just moved. And so I spent some time digging through all those boxes of, you know, like report cards from when you're in fourth grade that your parents keep, uh, and found all this stuff about wanting to be a writer. When I grew up, I found all these little like books I'd written and things. So, um, yeah, I was a pretty creative outdoorsy kid. I think it's sometimes amazing how those things track, you know, like 30 years later, um, I still have a lot of the same interests, which is kind of screwy and cool. Yeah. That's, um, I know I have a back at, at my mom's place. I believe it's there. There's a because I'm starting to work on some like middle school essays and high school essays. Mm -hmm. And I know I have a box of like notes from like girls and other things that from that we would pass back and forth and like in this Nike shoe box. And I hope she hasn't thrown it. it out, but it's like such a gold mine of just weird, awkward teenage stuff. And I'm like, Ooh, I got to get my hands on this stuff. Yeah, totally. My parents gave me a stack of like 25 journals from when I was in high school. And like, Lord, I can only imagine it's going to take a lot of uh, fortitude to go through (laughs) them, but I think they'll be fun. Uh, There's a lot of fodder in there for sure. I think about like, yeah, things I want to write about, uh, things that made me who I am. It was kind of cool to have them move and sort of be forced to, you know, look back in that way that happened a couple of weeks ago. So at at what point do you really lean into this idea of being a writer uh, as you like go track through high school and into college? Yeah, I think um, when I went to college, my parents really impressed upon me the need to do something practical, I think. My dad's a doctor. And uh, so I sort of leaned into thinking I would maybe be a therapist, which again, I think hilariously tracks with some of the things I ended up being interested in now, but I was a psychology major in college. But while I was completing that major, I did a lot of writing. Um, I was a nonfiction writing minor and I was doing internships at various magazines. I traveled a lot in college. And so I did a lot of travel writing, uh, but I think I had a pretty starry eyed view of the fact that I was going to graduate and like just write nonfiction essays for a living, right? Um, Which I think is common for a lot of us. And I got to graduation and realized like, oh, I have to like, you know, make some money also. So I applied for a job as a copywriter at Amazon and I got that. But as a backup plan, my smart, pragmatic uh, um, professor at Bucknell where I went to college forced me to apply to a couple graduate programs in journalism, which was not something I necessarily imagined doing, but was possibly a way to write as a career. And so I got a Fulbright scholarship to Boston University's journalism program and ended up, you know, choosing that over Amazon. Has I Had I chosen the Amazon route, I might be very wealthy. <laughs> now, um, it was a neat foray into magazine writing, science writing, and understanding kind of how to do this writing, you know, as a as a career. That's great. Would you have gone to grad school in journalism had you not gotten a, a full scholarship? <laughs> no. <laughs> I, people ask me this question all the time. You know, I think it 
it's controversial um, for a lot of folks going to a journalism graduate program means making connections, which can be super important for building a career, especially if you don't come from a background where you know a lot of people in that field. And for me, for sure, that's the biggest takeaway is just the people I know, the connections I made. Um, but yeah, the programs are too expensive. And I don't think as a journalist, you can plan on making that much out of the gate uh, and paying back those loans, right? So for me, the thing that made it possible was definitely that there was a scholarship involved. Otherwise, I don't think it would have been a feasible option. Yeah, I, uh, I earned an MFA back in 2008. So I went through 2006, 2008, a low residency thing. Mm -hmm. And and it's, it's something, and I kind of have to be careful how I frame this because I pitch MFA programs to sponsor the podcast sometimes. So it's, it's, it's hard for me sometimes to endorse it just because I think if you kind of go into it with enough rigor, you can build, essentially build your own MFA by reading the right books, making, you know, building a little community, whether it's a writing group that kind of gets a little bigger or, you know, what in whatever city you are, I almost feel like you can, you can build it yourself and piggyback on each other's experiences in, in a way, just do the work. And in, in that sense, you can almost get the same thing out of it by just kind of uh, cobbling it together on your own and not having, and you can eschew the debt in that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I run a podcast called The Writers Co-op with Wudan Yan, and she is a really interesting counter to me, I think, because she totally DIY'd her way into long form journalism. Like she, everything she has done is self-taught. And I would argue that she is more successful at it than most people I know who went to graduate school, right? So I think a lot of it is sort of about how you use whatever opportunities are handed to you. You know, there's not really a, uh, that's the thing with writing. There's no one golden path that if you go down it, you're going to end up as a successful person. Um, I, I really believe that. So, you know, I made a lot of good friends, had a lot of good connections. I think I got a lot of my jobs because of the folks I met in grad school. But um, yeah, not the rule that you have to do it. <laughs> I, I like what you said about the, how there's not one path. Yeah, there is no one path. I mean, uh, in our podcast, the podcast I run with Wudan, it's all about the business of freelance writing. And one of the things we have pushed on is tell us what your background is. Tell us if you have a partner. <laughs> you know, do you come from money? Because all these things make such a difference. Uh, regarding how you're able to navigate, right? Like we all come to the table starting at different points on the stairs and there is absolutely no way for us to all achieve the same thing. Um, and that has been striking to me. I think like I I feel that notion of being jealous, especially on social media where everything looks better than it is, <laughs> you know? Um, and I think that happens to me a lot where other people think that I am living the dream and I'm always so careful to say what I'm doing probably wouldn't work for you. You know, like my version works for me, but like, I'm not going to tell you to replicate what I've done because I have a very specific set of circumstances, right? And I'm coming to this with the privilege of having a partner and all sorts of other things. So um, yeah, it's one of my big push points. I think that like you have to figure out your own route through this in a way that's both going to like, you know, make you enough money to live and sort of fuel that creative, creative drive that obviously brought you to writing in the first place. So given that everyone you know, has their own sort of their, their, their experience that they're bringing to the table. And like you, you, like you said, you don't want, you wouldn't necessarily prescribe everything that you have done to somebody else. So that said, what are some very common things that no matter what base you're starting at, that you could say like, okay, these are like three things that are stone cold. You need to be doing these things to start, to, to get a start. Yeah, that's a. I think the first thing is that you need proof that you can write <laughs> on the internet. Um, you know, I work with a lot of young writers in my coaching practice who are trying to make it work as a freelancer. And the first big thing for chasing down clients and getting published is, do you have a place where someone could go to see what you can do? Um, and that doesn't necessarily have to be paid work in the beginning. Like I hesitate to say like blog for free forever, but, um, you know, just a few things that show what you can do. Um, that's big. I think the second big bucket is developing a sense of community. Like you said, you can maybe MacGyver your way into that MFA a little bit by having a tight writer community. Like you really can't do this by yourself. Like I, I'm very much an introvert. Like I wish you could, but you cannot, um, you need people who are like gonna, you know, have your back and sort of hustle you along when you get frustrated with this path, because there's a lot that's very cerebral about writing um, and a lot of ways that we get in our own way. And for me, at least the only way 
to get out of those bad head spaces is to be surrounded by people who are understanding of what I'm going through and also like can be like Jenny, you know, get back in the game. <laughs> and I'm trying to think, I think the other bit of this is just that there's a lot of mental and emotional work that comes around taking yourself seriously. Um, I'm a big proponent of therapy in that regard, like working through some of your old stuff to be able to approach this with some level of confidence and um, understanding that you are like, you're a business owner if you're running a freelance business, right? You are a writer um, if you are writing. And those hurdles, I think, are the things that get in our way when it comes to being really creatively productive. Uh, There's an element of imposter syndrome that can definitely kick in because when you when you identify maybe more as a creative type, it's hard to say that I am also an entrepreneur in a sense, because ultimately mm -hmm. like that's where so much of your energy really has to be. So you, then you can be the best creative self. So, mm -hmm. you know, how, how did you maybe wrestle with that? If you did it all to identify as not only a creative writer type, but also the type of person who is a business owner and that business happens to be you. Yeah, I have a good story about this one. Uh, I got laid off in 2018 from Wirecutter, which is the New York Times product review site. I was working there and they decided to eliminate my whole team. And I had no idea. Like uh, I've been at other places where I knew layoffs were coming. Like I, I had no clue. And so it really took me by surprise. I got a little bit of severance, but I had to grapple with a lot during that time period about my worth as a worker. I was editing there. Like, did I do something wrong? I was interviewing for other jobs and thinking like, I don't know if I want these jobs. Like um, it just really forced me to get super clear on what I wanted and what I didn't. I recognized that a lot of these newsroom jobs I was interviewing for were going to kind of be the same crap um, <laughs> that I'd been dealing with, that I was frustrated with, overwork, underpay, uh, not really doing the creative work that I was excited about. And I also, by the way, interviewed for some non-journalism jobs and was equally like, oh my God, I'm going to be bored, you know, fundraising, writing and things like that. Um, so I had a great therapist, like I said, big fan of therapy who forced me to create a business plan uh, for my quote unquote dream job. <laughs> like she was like, okay, if you're going to freelance, like what's it going to look like? I think that exercise really made a difference in terms of taking myself seriously because from the outset of deciding to freelance, which by the way, I decided I would only do for three months as an experiment. Uh, mm -hmm. Obviously three years later, I'm still doing it, but uh, I couldn't get up the nerve to even say like, I'm doing this permanently, right? Like the biggest jump I could take was like, I'll try it for the summer. And I think that act of sort of being super strategic and direct about what I wanted started me out on this foot of taking myself seriously, right? Like, and having to think about making room for the financial gains and then making room for the creative stuff because you do need both, right? Like you said, you, you need the money <laughs> to stabilize yourself enough to do their creative work. And so, yeah, I think partially it was that exercise and partially it has been a skill gained over time. Like, every coaching client I have like whispers to me that they have imposter syndrome as if it's this like, you know, dirty little secret. And the reality is, is that I deal with it all the time when I'm working on new projects, right? There are certain types of work that I've done so much now that I know and trust that I can be successful at those things. Um, but it is an act of like approaching terrifying, vulnerable things over and over again until you see that you can do them, um, until you can see and prove to yourself that you can be successful. So um, it's a mix of pragmatic stuff and mindset work for me, I think. What did that initial business proposal look like? Mm, so Wudan and I are actually launching a course, which uh, an e-course, which kind of walks people through this exact method, because I do this a lot during coaching. And I didn't realize it was unique um, until my therapist forced me into you know, sitting there and like, what are my services? What is my mission statement? Um, but yeah, it involved, first of all, checking in with my values, like what kind of work I like. I really am super independent. I like to manage my own time. Do not micromanage me or I'll lose my mind. You know, there are very specific things about the way I like to work, the types of projects I like to work on and what I care about. 
uh, this year, for example, I'm really like stoked on the idea of service. So helping other people. So that's one of my clear values. So it's about defining that I think upfront and then creating a business that allows you to get those things is the only way it's sustainable. So, um, there was a bit of that, a bit of that actual, like defining your services. So, you know, my services are writing, editing, and coaching, uh, specifically with writing, I write articles and I also occasionally write newsletters, you know, getting really, really clear on that. I got clear on pricing. So how much I was going to charge for those services. I got clear on who I wanted to help. Um, when I launched my business, I was very focused on uh, health related folks, but especially sort of like a health and wellness overlap, like where Eastern and Western medicine Overlap, So that's what I wrote about journalistically. And I took on some of those clients uh, who are brands in those spaces. So I was very clear on that. I was very clear on what they needed and how I was going to help them. Right. Like, I think I wrote in my business plan, journalism budgets are shrinking and I am the substitute teacher. I will come in with no drama, handle something for you for two weeks, and then I will leave. Um, Like, I think I literally wrote that down. Um, But yeah, it just involved like that stuff you kind of learn in college about like, what's the need? What service am I going to offer? But it's a total spin on what you initially think about when you're, uh, you know, going into a freelance writing business. Usually you would think about the writing. You wouldn't think about the rest, right? That happens to a lot of people. So it sort of is like nailing down what your best case scenario is before you get started with the work. And you you alluded to it there with not thinking about the the business side of it. Um, but what else might you identify as common mistakes that that you see people making that that perhaps burn them out or perhaps like they're just not hitting their potential and as a result, they might have to go get get an unruly steady day job that just takes them away from this thing that they started that they wanted to do. Yeah, there's a few things. The first is uh, you need a mix of services and clients. So one of the big mistakes I see people making is like, I'm going to write personal essays and that's what I do. And that's awesome. Um, That is so important. And that is part of your business plan. But you actually need to have a few other things. Uh, I do some writing for an HR company. I actually love it because it's pretty easy. It pays really well and it doesn't suck a lot of my creative energy, right? Like, and then I do some editing. Same thing, low emotional investment for me. I'm helping other people with their writing and that leaves enough creative room for me to do personal essays plus I'm making enough money. So there's this art to mixing the services you're going to offer so that they uh, use different parts of your brain. Um, And I think they're very... Like, for example, if I'm having a day where I'm just really not feeling creative, I have this other work I can go do so it's not wasted time, right? Because for me, especially nonfiction writing, like I really have to be in a sort of clear-headed space and I have a one-year-old and so there have been points in the past year where that has not been the case. So to have other services to fall back on has been hugely important. So I didn't have to go get another nine-to-five job, right? Like those are my stability. So I think, yeah, that's the first is mixing those things. And the second is just like taking every assignment that comes your way. Uh, I did this in the beginning, right? Wudan and I call it the panic hustle. It's like, Hmm. I have no money (laughs) and I'm just going to take whatever comes my way. There's something to be said for doing that early on so that you can think about which things are a fit for you if you're not sure, right? So like my first few months, I think I did a few projects I just really hated. Um, And it was like, okay, very clear. I'm not going to do those again. But what happens is people fill up their coffer with like 15 different projects that have, that are not paid very well and have no through line. So they're not connected to the mission. Like they're not like, oh, I'm building my business. It's just like, I'm doing random stuff and I'm not getting paid enough and I'm overworked boom, I'm burnt out and unhappy. I guess I go, you know, I got to go get a full-time job. That happens all the time. And so when coaching clients come in, the work there is like, let's go back to the beginning and figure out what you want and define that very clearly, what kind of work you think you want. And then we're going to laser focus on that. Also how much you need to make. And we're going to laser focus on clients who can pay you that. So you don't get sort of lost in the I always feel like they're like lost in the chaos of of freelancing in this terrible struggle hustle that, yeah, burnout is real and it's not a great place to be. Do you end up recommending that instead of like starting on, say, day one, actually, you want to kind of start on day three, 365 and like work backwards and then try to engineer 
what it'll look like in more digestible pieces? Yeah. So we, um, I'm a big fan of like auditing (laughs) your business, Mm -hmm. right? And looking back at what you've done and thinking about, okay, is this client actually working for me? Like a lot of times people sort of get trapped in these client relationships where they're making crap money and then they're sort of like pinned down and don't have time to do creative work. So it's like looking with a very clear mind at the list of things you've done and thinking, does this work for me? Does this not? Um, I do that at the end of every month, actually, also. I think it sort of helps you pivot. It's like, you know, you don't have to make that mistake for a year or get trapped for a year. Maybe you're trapped for a few months. But that sort of introspection aspect, I think, you know, I'm a yoga teacher, so that's probably why I have this sort of woo-woo angle to all of this. Um, but it, But it has helped me keep this sustainable. I'm, I get bored very quickly. Um, so I need to see when I'm bored and change things. Um, but yeah, I think at the end of the first year, there's never a bad time to do this kind of introspective work, right? Like, um, if it's at the beginning, great. If not, you can always get there a year two or 10 down the road if you need to. Now you, at, when you first started, you essentially gave yourself three months and, you know, of course that's turned into three years. So in those three months, you know, what, what did you set in motion and how did you create the momentum that has, that got, got the flywheel moving? First, I like announced my business and cried. (laughs) I always talk about this. Like people are like, it's so exciting to launch a business. I'm like, no, it's terrifying. Like, you know, uh, it's actually like awful because you've just told everybody that you're going to do this thing you really want. And if you screw it up, like everyone will know, <laughs> like, you know, that's the reality. Um, so yeah, I think, you know, I had this nice two month padding after getting laid off. I wrote a business plan um, in June of 2018. I was like, okay, I'm doing this for the summer. So at the beginning of that month, I told everybody what I was doing. I was super clear about it. Like I am running a freelance writing and editing business. These are my services. These are the things I want to do. I was super amped up. So I was like moving at the speed of light. I think there was a lot of momentum in there. I had a few, part of the reason I jumped into freelancing was because I had a few connections who had said, if you decide to freelance, let me know and I'll give you work. So I did have a few clients that I started with in uh, June. And I think a couple of those ended up lasting like my whole first year. So, you know, that built in stability, I think was really lucky. Uh, And that was all just based on my network, right? It was based on me just like saying, I got laid off. I need, I need work. Um, It was very shameless. It was not the most fun to do. My strategy is always, I say like, I'm looking for new clients, not I have no work. Um, But it's still a hard Mm -hmm. thing uh, to put yourself out there like that. So I think, yeah, it was a combo of like massive hustle, uh, really talking to people, which is, I'm really not a good classic networker. Like I, I'm, I love to talk to people about what I'm doing. And so that, ended up bearing fruit. And I did some pitching, um, not a lot, but some, you know, pitching publications, getting to know new editors, things like that. So it was really busy. I think the first month I made $15,000 and it was like horrible because I worked way too much um, and I had to learn to scale it back. But at the outset, that that kind of money was crazy, right? Like it just seemed wild um, that I could make that much using my writing skills. So yeah, it was a yeah. mix of editing, writing and, and some uh, reported journalism that month. That's incredible. I mean, that I think that will blow a lot of people's hair back uh, to to hear that. I know, like when I when I hear that, it's just yeah, it blow it blows my I'm bald, but it <laughs> blows my hair back. So, like, for how can you get people thinking in in those terms that 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 is possible? Yeah, it is possible. Um, I'll say this, Brendan. Like, money is a game. Like, money is like. If you say to someone, this is how much I charge, oftentimes, like, that's how much they pay you, right? And not necessarily in journalism or traditional writing um, worlds. Like, I say this, uh, keeping in mind that there's sort of a mix of clients in my coffer, right? So, like, I'm working with a big retail brand. Like, yeah, they're going to pay me $100 an hour, right? And if they're paying me $100 an hour and I'm working for 20 hours, that's $2,000, right? Um, so, I'm pretty big on, like, figuring out what your income level is what your desired income level is and then basically working backwards and only taking clients who can pay that and then 
keeping room for a couple of clients who can't pay that, but you're really excited about the work, right? So, um, you know, $15,000 meant not a lot of journalism. Uh, it was probably like 25% journalism, right? Um, and it meant working really freaking fast. <laughs> um, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of project rates. So what happened in those first few months is folks would say like, oh, okay, we'll bring you on for $5,000 to help with like a website re-up or something, right? Um, and so I knew if I worked like hyperspeed, uh, I was going to get paid double the normal hourly rate. So um, yeah, it's it's truly possible though. Um, it just depends what kind of clients you're trying to find. Uh, if you're pitching, cold pitching all day long and you're going from one off assignment to another one off assignment, it's pretty impossible um, to hit that. Plus you're exhausted. So there's it's the mix. It's that magic is the mix thing. Um, but I work with lots of folks who uh, bring in, you know, a solid like $12,000 a month as freelance writers, uh, doing a mix of content and some journalism. So uh, it's doable, I promise. <laughs> so what does, it's like, let's just throw out one, you know, major retailer. Let's just like use mm -hmm. REI, for example. Mm -hmm. You know, yep, if yeah, you're- They were one of my big clients that first year. Oh, there we go. Perfect. Uh, yep. So like, what does that look like? You're like, oh, there's REI. Of course, they have written content. Somebody is writing that stuff. So how do how do I, as Jenny Gritters, walk in like walk into the door and say, "Hey, this is what I do. I can be of service to you. Let's let's do this." Yeah, I think I'm pretty ballsy because that's exactly what I say. Um, you know, ideally, I have a connection in those places, right? Um, ideally. Uh, like, for example, with REI, I knew someone who knew someone, right? So I had someone make a direct connection for me there. And I, um, when I got in touch with them, some of this is luck, right? Like they were thinking about wanting to build out some product reviews. And I had just been laid off from a company that creates product reviews. So, uh, you know, it was sort of a good fit in that regard. But um, I do, I send an email and I say, hey, what's up? This is me. Um, a little bit about me. I have been working in the industry for 10 years. I have a master's degree in this. Here's some publications. You know, I'm super efficient. I like, you know, I'm easy to work with. I'm super stoked on the content that you're making and I want to work with you. Like, what do you need? Uh, it's, um, yeah, it's a little ballsy, but it works. And I think the thing is, is that I truly believe that I can help them. Um, and I'm excited about helping them. Like, it's not false, right? Uh, and I, and I do believe that I'm good at what I do because it's been proven to me, you know, over years of working with other clients. So, um, you know, for them, I did some product review stuff, but I also did a lot of actual journalism, like reported journalism work for the co-op journal, which is their blog. So, you know, a lot of times when I'm talking to writers, I'm like, the work that you do now for traditional media publications, uh, it actually like can be sold verbatim you know, you can use those skills exactly for brands as well if they have publications. So yeah, a lot of what I was doing for them was reporting on outdoor stuff, news, um, lots of feature stories for them about mental health, things like that. So it was a really fruitful relationship for a couple of years, right? Um, it was super fun. And I was just sort of there, right? Like I was like there depending on what they needed because their thing, you know, their their direction was going to change. That happens a lot with big brands. Um, and I'm just there, you know, to help, to build things, to talk about things, to consult. I love to be there in that way and also not be full-time so that I don't have to deal with the bureaucracy or the drama. <laughs> yeah. And uh, Seth Godin is famous for saying, especially in his freelancers workshop with the, the Akimbo workshops, that if you want to level up as a freelancer, it's, it's all about, you know, getting better clients and mm -hmm. they, and that means going to the REIs of the world target, whoever, you know, whoever it is. And you take your skill there and you, you can, you can charge, you can ask, ask for more money. And then like, like, like a project rate, you can ask for a, you know, a big rate. And then if you do that really, really fast and do it well, it's like your hourly rate is like quadrupled. So mm -hmm. it was that something that was very intuitive to you that, or did you, it was, was that something like you had to learn? It's like, I could, um, that, you know, I could be pitching the local newspaper or I could, I'm never going to make a living there, but you know, I got to go find better clients and that's who, who has the deeper pockets and then, you know, move my shingle over that way. You know, I had one month in my first year where I wrote 25 stories. Uh, each of them were paid like $200 it was the most miserable month 
of all time. <laughs> it was horrible. Um, so I think I learned pretty quickly that like these little fiddly projects, you know, the hundred, two hundred, three hundred dollar paid things, um, were not actually worth it. Like what I wanted to go hunting for was bigger chunks, right? Big project fees, bigger um, things like companies that wanted to bring me on for $2,000 a month or something like that, right? So, and that mindset still stands. I'm pretty wary of taking like small one-off projects. I really want either bundled projects or um, reoccurring projects, things like that. So um, I think I learned it only through trial and error, right? Like, like I said, at the beginning, I just sort of like ended up doing whatever I was doing. I was just, you know, whatever people would offer me, I was like, sure. Yeah. Um, and I didn't feel great about those smaller things either. You know, my first year freelancing, I wrote 150, uh, stories. I think my second year I wrote maybe 30. And so there was just a big difference in the quality, you know, being able to spend a longer period of time. If it's $150 for an assignment, I can spend an hour and a half on it. And can I really do good reporting work in an hour and a half? Like, I mean, I guess if I need to do one interview, maybe, but uh, I would rather be able to sort of work in larger chunks. Um, it just suits my my finances and my personality better. For sure, because you can't work any more hours. So there's no, the only way for it to work and maintain your sanity is to go out and find find the better clients who are going to challenge you. But, you know, they're in, in that way, you're going to bring great work that you're passionate about. And yeah, they're going to pay a lot, but they'll probably get more than they paid for in the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, it requires like ditching the clients that aren't paying you enough, which I think for me is the harder part. I'm very much a people pleaser. And I sort of like, I don't make friends with my clients, but I am often fond of them if I've been working with them for a long time. And so, you know, I try to be pretty clear with them. Like I have to go look for other work because my hourly rate is higher now. Uh, but it's that to me is like gutting. It's just a horrible part of, um, you mm -hmm. know, having to say no. I, I made a spreadsheet for myself this year where I record all the times I've said no. Um, because if someone offers me something, my gut reaction is to say yes, but I have a lot less time right now because I'm taking care of a, a small human. And so I can't say yes, uh, but it's really hard for me. It's so hard. Uh, but it's the only way that you can start making more is by uh, redirecting your focus for sure. Now, as as people, you know, get into this uh, or even are dancing with that initial fear of taking a, a, an entrepreneurial leap, mm -hmm. where where have you found that people tend to get lost or they they tie their brain up in knots that keeps them from jumping, if that makes any sense? Yep, it totally does. Um, I always say I was lucky that I got laid off because I was forced out. Right. Um, it is so much harder to leave a full time gig and dive into something like freelancing. Um, when I watch people do that, I am so deeply impressed with their bravery. Right. Um, I think where most people get hung up is waiting for it to be perfect, waiting for it to be the perfect scenario. Um, you know, I have a lot of folks who are like, oh, like, you know, once I have another project on board, then I can leave my job. And it's like, well, you're going to have to go look for that project. Like, it's not just going to appear. Um, you know, you make your own best case scenario. And so, you know, a lot of people get caught up in like, my website isn't quite right. I don't have enough clips um, or, or evidence of past work. You know, all these things are just our brains trying to protect us from doing something scary and so a lot of my coaching clients, I have them do work around like figuring out how to, like you said, sort of dance with the fear of it, right? Like whether it's sitting down and taking two minutes to write down what your fear brain is telling you so that you don't act out of fear, you act out of what you want um, or getting up and going for a run to sort of shake things up. There's lots of sort of strategies around that. But um, yeah, the perfectionism thing, the wanting it to be the perfect time, the perfect website, the perfect uh, brand name, the perfect client, uh, like there is no perfect scenario. <laughs> but once you get in it, you'll make it work, right? Um, but yeah, it's just hard. Also, I think that's the other thing. People expect that at some point it might feel easier. It does not. Uh, it's it's always hard. Uh, you mm -hmm. just kind of get, you get used to the hard, right? But it, it there's no, yeah, there's no moment in which it's going to be like, oh, this is so easy for me to just like launch my own business. Like, nope, sorry. Because <laughs> 
uh, uh, something that strikes me and what what keeps me from sometimes uh, taking more courageous leaps with you know my life or career is I will think about these worst case scenarios in my mm-hmm. head, like uh, whether that's you know getting audited by the IRS or even like sometimes the contract nightmares that you and Woodan talk about. Like mm-hmm. thinking of those things sometimes uh, like uh, handcuffs me in a way like, oh, my God, how am I going to handle it? Like, how am I going to negotiate this? Or if someone's not paying and I got to really, you know, crack the whip on this or negotiate something weird in, in the contract or read con- like some sometimes that will will uh, tie me in knots. And I wonder mm-hmm. if you know how you you know maybe wrestle with that yourself and how you maybe pull people out of that funk. Be like, listen, it's not as bad as you think. Yeah. I mean, the question is really like, which terrible, you know, there's a shit sandwich in every situation, right? Like, (laughs) um, like for me being stuck in a job I hate is far worse than the risks of, you know, getting screwed on a contract, to be honest. Right. Like, and I know that about myself and for some people, the stability is absolutely more important than the sort of consistent challenge and freedom of freelancing, right? So, um, you know, usually I talk to people about like, okay, what's the worst case scenario? On the flip side, what's the best case scenario? Um, And then we talk about what would happen in the worst case scenario. Like, okay, so you get screwed on a contract, what happens? Um, You know, and, and playing that situation out, it often becomes evident that it's probably not as bad as you think. And for a lot of people, it's actually not as bad as the current situation that they're in, right? Like, they're currently in, like, a lot of people come and they're like, I hate my job. I hate my full time job. Like, I just really want to freelance. Um, And they're so miserable that dealing with some of those other risks is you know, less bad. Uh, and I think that's true for me. Uh, absolutely. Like the freedom of freelancing, you know, I'm living on the road right now. We put all our stuff in a storage unit and my husband is a travel nurse and like, I would not be able to do this if I had a full-time job. Um, you know, there's just a lot of freedom that's inherent. So for me, it's like, yeah, seeing the benefits, the benefits to me always outweigh some of those risks. And then the other answer is just that like, you can't do it by yourself. Like, you're not just going to be like sitting there staring at a horrible contract by yourself. There's going to be other freelancers around you. You know, it's why Wutan and I do what we do and teach people about contracts. But it's like, there's no way to do this by yourself. Um, But there's actually a lot of people out there who are dealing with the same thing who can walk you through it, um, which makes it a lot less scary. when When you get into this kind of kind of racket, you know, you have to be, you know, very organized. And I'm someone who is inherently disorganized and I have to do everything in my power to I mean, it is it is a struggle to keep things straight, keep records and spreadsheets and papers all straight like it's just a nightmare my my wife hates me for it and she's <laughs> she is on me like a like a linebacker on a fumble like if i have one thing out of place when it comes to at least you know financial stuff business related stuff like you know she's got that organizational brain i'm just not there uh, yep. so i always i love unpacking how people stay organized and develop systems and routines. So, so for you, like maybe, uh, are you inherently organized and how do you stay organized and what are those, what do those sit systems look like for you, Jenny? Yeah, I'm like an organizational taskmaster. <laughs> um, all of my past jobs, I've been like the air traffic controller, right? The one who manages the systems and keeps all the trains running. Uh, that is just who I am. Um, it might make sense to you that when I was 16, my parents used to give me a chunk of money every year and I had to budget that money for the whole year to buy myself like lunches and socks and things. So um it was bred into me very, very early uh, to keep track of these things. But yeah, so I, um, again, along with that business plan, I think when I started out, I was just very clear about sort of building myself the kind of system I would build if I was at a publication working as an editor. So um, I did too many things. Like I had too many spreadsheets and like it got a little crazy. Uh, So I've now sort of compressed, right? I have like one spreadsheet where I track all my assignments. um, And that helps me see how much work I have coming in. So for each month I have like, you know, I'll write down all the things I'm going to invoice for that month and look at the amount I'm pulling in. And if it's not my target amount, I know I need to go out and find 
something else to add to that list that month. Um, so that spreadsheet is probably the most key one for me. And then I use QuickBooks because it automates invoicing because I hate chasing invoices more than all the things in the world. And so it actually sends reminders to clients and it'll tell you like, you know, this payment is due in six days. Uh, so those are my two main sort of organizational systems. I think um, Wu Dan and I for our podcast have like the most giant uh, Google Drive folder of all time with like a million spreadsheets and things because we both have brains like that. But, you know, the reality is also that like whatever works for your brain is what you should build. As an editor, I worked with a lot of very scattered writers and like no one had the same system. Uh, and that's okay. Like our brains are all different. But yeah, you need some way to know how much money you're making and some way to know what assignments you have, especially once you have a lot of assignments. Uh, you know, I often will have like 10 or so cooking at the same time and like there's no way to keep track of those in your brain. Um, and so, yeah, like tracking those deadlines and things is important. And you basically have kind of like a, like a business umbrella, right? Under which you mm -hmm. kind of file from like, the, and when mm -hmm. you registered that, is that like, did you go the LLC route or like sole prop or, um, you know, assume business name? Like what was the logistics around that? Yeah, I have two LLCs now, actually. I have my business and the Writers Co-op has an LLC. I always say like, cool. And I now own two businesses um, mm -hmm. accidentally. Um, but, you know, the reality is, is that from like a tax filing standpoint, LLCs really are the same as a sole proprietor. And so I always tell people for me, it was more of like a mindset decision, um, you know, to have to have a business license on my wall and like pay quarterly taxes, um, like business taxes to the state of Washington, things like that, um, really forced me to like take myself seriously. Uh, you know, for the podcast, the LLC has some practicalities uh, where we funnel money through that and pay ourselves paychecks and have a shared bank account, um, things like that. You can't get a business bank account uh, unless you co-own an LLC with a person you're not married to. So, um, yeah, I think there are some practicalities once you get into a little more complicated setup like the podcast, but uh, it's truly yeah, like your your decision. The one thing I always tell people is great is to have a business bank account that is separate from the checking account that you have for your life or with your partner. Um, I have that and then I pay myself a paycheck every month so that if I make a lot this month and not a lot next month, um, I still the leftover. So say I make $10,000 this month, I pay myself 4,000. There's 6k still sitting in there. Um, it pads next month a little bit. Um, and that has been helpful for me in terms of just sort of, yeah, like managing the flow of money, um, and separating it a little bit from my family's finances. Nice. And, and also you say you established your you know, very organized, always been that kind of air traffic controller. I, I like mm -hmm. that term. That's really, <laughs> really good. Um, so, Given that, you know, you're also a mom to a, a one-year-old and there's always, you know, social, social media and there's all the, the work that you have on your plate, you know, mm -hmm. how, how best do you stay focused and on track to make sure you're, you know, getting, getting your stuff done and, you know, like I said, just kind of staying on track? You can't see me, but I'm like cracking up right now because it's really chaotic. Um, <laughs> you know, like I wish I could give you an answer that's like, yeah, it's so great. Um, no, it's totally chaos. Uh, you know, I'm four days a week. I'm solo with my son and um, which means I just work during his naps. And, you know, when he decides not to take naps, that's great because then I don't get to work. So it has been really hard um, and it has been pretty high learning curve. What I have been doing lately that I think helps is taking about 20 minutes on Sunday night to define what my priorities are for that week. Um, and it's usually like four or five things, but those are the things I have to get done. And they're not actually anchored to any one day. It's just like by the time Friday rolls around, I better have finished it. That has really helped, I think, in terms of like when I do get a window of time, I have this panic of like, oh my God, what am I supposed to do? <laughs> I have so much to do. And so having really clearly defined priorities has been the only way to sort of not get lost in social media and answering podcast emails, but to actually like focus on the things that need to get done that week. Uh, otherwise I'm screwed. And there's a lot of evening working and sometimes weekend working. And there's a lot of me saying no to things, right? Um, which is extremely hard for me. My husband jokes that like most people would be stoked to like work less. And I'm like, 
so sad um, when I have to say no to big projects. Uh, I love to work, um, but I also love hanging out with my kid. And so it's been a uh, it's been a learning curve for sure to kind of like extract the super productive self from my identity a little bit and understand how to really focus on the things that matter. Um, and actually, part of that is like carving out time to do some more nonfiction personal essay writing, which I haven't done in a while, um, which is important to me. And so figuring out how to work that in and actually not let the high paid client work overtake that time um, has been, yeah, that's like my my struggle and learning in the past three months, the thing I've been working on the most. Uh, what would you identify as some growing pains that you experienced, uh, especially early on in your practice? I am just super prone to being the person who does everything. I think that was my identity in past jobs. Like it was always like, oh, you have a question? Go ask Jenny. She knows. Oh, you need someone to help with an extra project? Like go ask Jenny. She'll get it done. Um, <laughs> that was just always me. And so once I you know, once you set out on your own, those things don't disappear. Like I wish they did, but like, turns out like you'll drive yourself the same way you drove yourself at full-time jobs. And the awareness of that is, uh, hard. Sometimes, um, the patterns you've developed at past jobs don't leave. So for me, um, you know, knowing I had to set myself an upper limit of how much work I was allowed to take on and how much I, could make um, in order to prevent myself from taking on too much. And it still didn't always work, right? Um, because the result of the overwork is burnout, which I have also had periods of being crazy burnt out. Um, when I was pregnant, I knew I was going to take four months off. So I was like a hustle queen and, you know, making like that, like 13, 14 K a month. Um, and I was also pregnant and like really uncomfortable and it was just horrible. And so, yeah, like there was a lot of work to teach myself how to step back <laughs> and like mm. not be the person who does it all. And then, yeah, the other thing is that people pleasing aspect of me and learning that like setting boundaries is actually kind with my clients. You know, I I don't want to be the go-to person for them because I don't work for them full time. And mm -hmm. so defining the hours I'm going to work and the tasks I'm going to take on and you know, all the logistics, uh, defining that up front has made a huge difference for me feeling like I own my time um, and I own my business and I'm not going to get taken advantage of. Uh, I think early on, I just, again, was like, yeah, whatever you need, I'm here. Right. Um, and it's like, whatever you need within X context is what I'm available to provide. Yeah. It's, it's all kind of the same bucket, right? This like wanting other people to approve of my work and, and love what I'm doing whether it's overwork or, you know, being too acquiescent, uh, that's been a huge learning curve. I think the past year I've been a little better about it, but those first two years, that's what would get me into trouble. Now, as writers, it's very important to uh, be, you know, as voracious as possible, uh, a, a reader and a consumer of either, you know, articles, what's out there, you know, colleagues work to support them, even, mm -hmm. you know, books books and everything too. So, so what are you reading or what are some things that you return to uh, in terms of your reading and a reading practice that helps kind of put, put that kind of fuel in your tank? Yeah, I, um, I've always been a voracious reader. When I was a kid, we would go to the library and I would get to pick out 10 books every week. I would get like, you know, I would like fly through them. Um, and I actually still love reading young adult fiction and sci-fi. That's like one of my guilty pleasures. So those get mixed in with some of the more hefty um, nonfiction writing work. So, um, you know, I just finished, it's called the Grisha verse. It's a trilogy YA series. Um, and so I pair that with like, you know, the body keeps the score, which is a book about trauma um, or how we show up, which is a book about community by my bird song that I just finished. Um, so it's typically kind of like a, a mix of those things. And then, uh, I have a couple newsletters that dump into my inbox that have good long form writing that I'll sometimes look at. But I, I honestly also, my interest in reading things on the internet ebbs and flows. Like sometimes I'm really in phases where I want to read books and I want to bury myself in long form work in a book context. And there's sometimes where, you know, I really want to be reading magazine long form. Um, and those things change, I think, quite a bit. So um, I am working through the artist's way again, um, doing morning pages. And, um, you know, I read Big Magic a couple months ago, things that sort of help you think about creativity and unblocking your creativity. 
those are usually in the mix too. So I guess I'm like a nonfiction plus YA sci-fi plus self-help uh, mixer, <laughs> if that makes sense. Oh, of course. And I, I've, I've been thinking about this a lot lately. Um, you know, early on, I would, let's just say 10 or 15 years ago, like I had a certain vision of what being a writer was of what kind of a writer I would be and what kind of work I would be doing. And that's definitely a lot different now than it, than I would have thought back then. Mm -hmm. And I've had to kind of come to grips with my identity sort of changing as a writer and a reporter and uh, who would have thought I'd be producing podcasts. So mm -hmm. I wonder for you, like how is maybe your identity changed as a writer and creative person, you know, over the, over the years? I think about this all the time too. I constantly struggle with what to put in my bio. Like, am I a journalist or am I a writer or am I mm -hmm. an editor? I guess now I'm a coach. I'm also a podcast co-host. Um, you know, there's a lot, it changes for me so often um, as to how I think about myself and what services I want to offer to people, right? So, uh, you know, this past year has been a pretty dry spell for me in terms of creating journalism because I was so sleep deprived and had a young kid and I couldn't go out and report. It just wasn't a priority for me. Uh, I wasn't doing a lot of feature writing. Like I, I couldn't like synthesizing complex thought with everything that was going on was so hard. So I took journalists off of my bio, right? I just said I was a freelance writer and editor and then I added it back on. Um, you know, the through line for me has always just been that writing is how I creatively process things. And I think the first year of running my business, I'd been an editor, a staff editor for so long that I was so excited to write that I was just going to write whatever anybody wanted me to write. And now it's more important to me that I am writing things that I care about um, or that have an impact on people. So I'm okay if the overall volume is less but it needs to be something that matters to me, which makes it much uh, more nerve wracking. <laughs> I think like the, uh, the, low, the stuff I did the first year was very low vulnerability and the stuff that I am working on now and pitching now is just, there's a lot more me in it. And that's something I've been nervous about doing. It's something that sometimes gets worked out of you a little bit when you're in journalism, the idea that you would put yourself into stories or write, you know, reported essays, things like that. So um yeah, like I think it changes every month. What I've realized is that I will always be writing in some way uh, and I will always probably be teaching in some way. That's the writer's co-op is, is you know, a lot of what I'm doing is teaching. Same with coaching. So those two things I think will always be a part of what I do. But uh, how that looks may change every year, every month, every week. <laughs> Yeah, and as we kind of bring this bring this airliner down for a landing, let's um let's just talk a little bit about the about the podcast that you and Wudan started, and now you're just what has that experience been like, and maybe unpacking that, you know, what was the expectations you had going in, and just uh and where you know and where that where that journey has taken you, so to speak. Yeah, I had this really weird moment this week where I joined a text thread of a bunch of writers who were doing the artist way morning pages stuff. And uh, I introduced myself and this one woman was like, oh, my God, you're Jenny Gritters and you're here. And it's still <laughs> so like strange to me that, you know, people listen to Udan and I talk and enjoy it and learn things from us and know who we are. Um, we started the podcast uh, we started working on it in late 2019, and uh, both Wudan and I were getting like dozens of requests every week for people who wanted to pick our brains and like understand how we were doing things. And she and I would text constantly about contracts and, you know, BS, like pay things, uh, business stuff. We were both like really obsessed with it. And so one day she was like, we should launch a podcast. And for whatever reason, like, you know, I have zillions of creative ideas that never get actually acted upon. And for whatever reason, this one did. So we sat down, we like had a meeting about what our first season was going to be about. And I'd actually been thinking for a long time about making an ebook or something that sort of collated how to run a business, a freelance writing business. And so our first season was that it was like business planning, semantics, right? All of these sort of logistical things. Um, and 
we got a huge following because we launched in March, which was right when the pandemic started, which was right when a lot of people decided they were going to freelance. So it's been a little bit of a uh, crazy ride. You know, I think our podcast has like, you know, 50,000 downloads now. And like we have a membership program. Uh, I have this robust coaching business now basically because of the podcast. And we're going to launch e-courses next month. We have um, mastermind groups that are going to start soon too. So um, it's been pretty wild and also really, really fun to just, I mean, it's all been an experiment. Like would Dan will be like, Hey, should we do this thing? And I'm like, sure. You know, and then we try it. And if it does, if it doesn't work, it's like, okay, whatever. We'll just try a different thing. Right. Like we were just like, Oh, maybe we'll launch an event or two. And now that's a huge part of the business model. Um, but yeah, it's been fun. And it also feels like, like sitting on a train that is just moving of its own accord. Like we, we've done no marketing, you know, it's really just sort of word of mouth. Um, but we've met so many cool people and it does, I think it saved me a little bit in 2020, which was such a hard year to feel like there was sort of a through line and a way to help people, you know, um, to help them empower them, you know, logistically give them tips for thriving instead of just landing in a situation that they didn't want to be in, in the first place. So, um, yeah, it's been pretty, pretty sweet. Um, season three launches in April, And yeah, I mean, having a creative project to collaborate on with someone is not to be underestimated. Like freelancing is really lonely. And so being able to work on something with someone else is is pretty awesome. That's uh, one of the key reasons I started this podcast way back when was just to appease a lot of my loneliness, among other feelings. But Mm -hmm. it was definitely loneliness and uh, admiring people that were getting to have these kinds of conversations. But no one was going to knock on my door to have them. So I was like, well, I might as well try to have them myself with other people. And that's kind of what this turned into. So Totally. I feel like people are always like, oh, wow, so strategic, so amazing. And it's like, I mean, kind of, it's just Wudan and I having the conversations we would have over text, like publicly, you know, Um, the second season we got to bring on freelancers to give their advice, like really successful people. And that was super fun. And season three is actually us doing live coaching with folks who are dealing with things like we talked about today. So, you know, perfectionism, imposter syndrome, being over busy. Um, So I'm stoked about that. It's been super fun. And also it's low pressure because if we ever want to stop doing it, we can, right? It's just like purely for the benefit of the collaboration, the creativity and the service to people. And that is what has been great about it. I think like neither of us had many expectations going into it. Fantastic. Well, uh, well, Jenny, uh, give me a few social media handles to make sure that we uh, people, if they want to follow and get more familiar with you, your work, with Ann's work, and the podcast, uh, where they can find you. Yeah, absolutely. So my website is JennyGritters.com, and um, I'm at Jenny Gritters on Twitter or Instagram. That's where I spend most of my time, although I have a troubled relationship with social media and tend to like leave it for random weeks at a time. Um, And yeah, sometimes it's great and sometimes it's not. Um, The Writers Co-op, the best place to find us is at TWC underscore pod on Twitter. That's where we talk about kind of everything that we're doing, or you can find the Writers Co-op, you know, wherever you podcast. And we have a Patreon program, which is how you get worksheets. Like I give you homework and, um, you know, lots Mm -hmm. of events and things like that through our Patreon um, program, which is just patreon backslash twc um so yeah um come come hang out with us on the internet and talk about making more money as a freelancer <laughs> I and it should be noted that it's jenny with an i not a y yes oh yes thank you for that yeah jenny with an i not jennifer just jenny fantastic well it's great talking to you jenny yeah thanks brendan this has been fun As we are wont to say, that was a toe tap and good time, wouldn't you say? And so we've come to the end. Thanks for listening, and thanks to Jenny Gritters for the time and the insights. If nothing else, go subscribe to her and Wudan's podcast, The Writer's Co-op, wherever you podcast. It's advice you can put into practice right away if you want a side hustle or a full-on front hustle. In this day and age, I'm telling you, freelancing is the new stable job. And I, I, I work for a paper that is notorious, or I work for a, a paper that is owned by a corporate entity that is notorious for gutting newsrooms. So believe me, freelancing can extricate you from that anxiety. It has its own, has its own can of worms worth of anxiety, but at least some of it is in your control. This show was a production of Exit 3 Media and everything 
by me, Brendan O'Mara. Hey, hey. You'll want to head over to brendanomara.com. Uh, hey, hey. For show notes and to sign up for the monthly newsletter. As I continue to try to subvert social media, the the permission asset that is my newsletter is the best way to stay plugged in to the entire enterprise and get entered in book raffles and the like. I don't keep all the books I get. What kind of guy would I be if I did that? I like to give them away, man. I've been so overwhelmed lately, I, I tend to look around and get rid of stuff. Like the great Ra's al Ghul says, quote, when the forest grows too wild, a purging fire is inevitable and natural, end quote. Anyway, point being, newsletter gets you books, because I like to purge, uh, you know, books and not food. Uh, I did in college, I used to be a janitor at this bakery on campus, and they used to have a whole lot of leftover donut holes, and I always have it. Like, I have a weird, like, perverse, almost twisted relationship with food, and I would put the glazed donut holes in my mouth, and I would chew them and, like, taste them, and then I would spit them out in the in the garbage can, and my buddy Jay Rue was just like, what are you doing? Like, are you coming up with a new eating disorder? I'm like, yeah, man, you get you get the benefit of the taste without having to eat the whole thing. He was just like, how do we get on? How do we get on this topic? Oh, purging. Anyway, point being, the newsletter gets you books, cool articles, blogs, podcast news, grants you access to the monthly CNF and Happy Hour. This month, there's no guest, but the topic is social media. So we'll be jamming on that topic. And I'll have just a few questions. See see how you're handling it. How do you don't get sucked into the vortex of it? Maybe you do. Maybe you want to get out of that. So we're just going to have some drinks and talk about social media and how it affects or doesn't affect your writing. And uh, we'll just have a, a nice little 40-minute happy hour. Sound good? I hope so. I'll be there. And uh, drinks will be on ice. Still doing the review for Coaching Jam. Post your review to Apple Podcasts. Any written review will do. Take a screenshot when it publishes. Send that screenshot to me, either creativenonfictionpodcast at gmail.com or brendan at brendanomera.com, either or. And I'll coach up a piece of your writing of up to 2,000 words for realsies. I'm already helping a handful of folks, so do it. Do it. For now, you can keep the conversation going on Twitter and Instagram at CNFPod. Strangely, not a single person ever does. No one ever takes me up on the offer to keep the conversation going. <laughs> it's almost like no one wants to do it, uh, which is all the more reason that I need to fully just get rid of these social media profiles. If I told my wife that, she'd be like, this is why you fail, this is why you're a fucking loser. And uh, I couldn't argue with her. Uh, that's the voice in my head. But maybe I'm doing it wrong, maybe not. Who the hell knows? At my website, down the right rail, I've created a newsstand of sorts of blogs I admire. That way I never have to troll social media to find a, a select few that I really, really like. It's uh, it's like the old Google Reader, I think. I just found, I just had to build my own, essentially. and So there it is. I, I go down to that rail and I click on those and see... See what they're up to on any given day. If they've posted something new, cool, read it. If they have a newsletter to subscribe to, I subscribe to it. And then I go about my day. I'm running an end around around social media as best I can. So if you get that newsletter, my newsletter, consider sharing it or forwarding it. I hesitate to ask you to link up to the show on social media as I try to get rid of it. It seems like a, a dick move to do that, but I want to make sure I'm making the best possible work. While I'm getting off social media, but I don't know. It's a, it's a toxic shithole that just makes me feel like crap more than half the time. And why would you subject yourself to that for the purposes of self-promotion, for a connection? I don't know, man. Making the best possible work and, and just trying to get out of that toxic shithole that is any given Twitter feed. Great essay title there, by the way. Uh, I'd rather avoid it. Not get my... Ask data mind more than I already am. I mean, I'm typing this in a Google Doc, and you don't think Google Google bots are and like scanning every damn word right now? Anyway, I'm crafting an essay on the erasure of all my tweets. I have ten thousand, ten thousand, ten point two thousand, I guess, to go. Uh, it's kind of a 
a fun exercise and a sad one, too. I'm calling it Twitter side for now. It's like going back through time, and it's so cringeworthy. And not because the things I tweeted were necess- were bad necessarily, but they're just sad, pathetic cries for attention. That's what's so sad about it. All for one like, or worse, none. And so it's like you're just talking to nobody. And the thought process that was, oh, here's something funny, and now I must either pull out my phone or... If I'm on my computer and like, all right, let me open up Twitter and type this thing out. And yeah, they're going to love this one for this validation. And why should I need that kind of validation? Tweets expire faster than sushi. So why? Uh, so why? And this is why I actually delete any new tweets after a week these days. I've been doing that for a few months now. And uh, this goes to a larger theme that lately I just want to disappear. Not in a suicidal way, just kind of vanish and go into my little cave and draw and write and because I like to draw and write and make zines. But then I get the itch. I got to take a picture of that shit and share it on Insta. Got to get that dopamine hit. Got to see the little heart light up. Got to find a way to get out of my own head. It's a sad state of affairs, man, I tell you. But don't worry. Everything's okay. I mean, it's mostly okay. Ha <laughs> ha. I've got it good. I do. But you know how it is. It's all tough. Parents getting old. Dad uh, turned 77 today. Seems in good spirits. I can't believe he's made it this far. Yeah, memories are fading. His is a little slippery. The mother's is real slippery. You know, you just kind of feel like, uh, aside from that, kind of feel like shit. Eat too much. Drink too much. Just to escape the mundanity of it all. Constantly fret over not doing enough. But you find the time for bullshit over there. But you won't do the hard work over here. And the to-do list grows. And that tomato sauce keeps getting crustier and crustier on that casserole dish. till you're just like, fuck it. Fuck it, man. Listen. Things are trending real dark real fast. So I'm going to get out of here before things get real bleak. Like wedding singer bleak. So stay cool, CNFers. Stay cool forever. See ya. <laughs>